Greetings again and welcome. We're opening up again with our continued midweek Bible study on foundations of the Christian faith. Today we're going to be looking at the Christian church and fellowship. So we're going to be looking at what it means as Christians in uh, what we believe and how we relate to other Christians and other church bodies as well. I want to start off with this story. Paul and Silas had a pretty rough day in Philippi. After saving a slave girl from an evil spirit that tormented her, they had been angrily accosted by her owners. Dragged into the marketplace, the two missionaries were arrested, stripped, and severely flogged. A punishment severe enough to kill a man. Exhausted and bleeding, they were finally dumped off at the city jail. Even the jailer had no pity on his helpless captives. He ordered them to be locked up all night with their feet in the stocks to cause additional discomfort. Yet despite all their troubles, Paul and Silas remained in good spirits, praying and singing hymns and telling their fellow prisoners about their Savior Jesus. Around midnight, a tremendous earthquake shook the prison so violently that the doors swung open and the prisoners' chains were all torn loose. The jailer rushed outside, and when he saw the doors open, he fell to his knees in dismay. Under Roman law, any prisoner that escaped, the jailer paid for it with his life. Resolving that he would rather die quickly now than be publicly executed later, the jailer drew his sword and prepared to commit suicide. Before he could go through this plan, a voice stopped him in his tracks. It was Paul, calling from the darkness of the jail. Don't harm yourself, we are all here. Astounded, the jailer called for lights and saw that what Paul had said was true. Despite his excessively cruel treatment of the two missionaries, they had convinced all the other prisoners to stay in their cells thus saving their captor's life. The jailer was overcome with emotion. What could possibly cause these two men to show him such kindness after he had showed them nothing but cruelty? They must have some connection with God, he thought, and asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas were happy to share the good news that salvation requires no action on our part. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. The jailer was so happy to find out this good news about Jesus, that at that very hour of the night, he took Paul and Silas into his home, washed their wounds and bandaged them. Then, at the suggestion of the missionaries, he had every member of his family baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This was a common practice in early Christianity. The head of a household, after becoming a Christian, wanted everyone in his household, from the very old to the very young, to be adopted into the family of God. Without knowing it, the jailer and his family joined a much larger family, the family of God. In those few hours, they joined the millions throughout history who had been made sons and daughters of God through Jesus. Now we're going to read Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he 
and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. The jailer told Paul, The magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The, the officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. Okay, again we're looking at foundations of the Christian faith, the Christian church, and fellowship. We look at 1 Peter 2. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, there is only one holy Christian church on earth, one group of people set aside as God's family who will join him in eternity those who have been called out of a sinful life and into a life of faith in Christ. That's what we mean when we talk about the Holy Christian Church. Now, this church is called Holy because all of its members have had their sins removed. It's called Christian because it's built upon Jesus Christ, the Savior. And it's called a church because it's a distinct group of people. We read on. Scripture tells us, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. That's Romans 10, 12-17. So then how does a person become a member of the Holy Christian Church? They become a member by hearing the gospel message, and the Holy Spirit works through that message and creates faith. So wherever God's word is being preached, members of the Holy Christian Church are present. Wherever it is not preached, members are not present. Let's look also at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
So how do we know if someone is a member of this church? Well, only God can read hearts. He alone knows who has true faith in Christ. And so we often call the Holy Christian Church an invisible church. We read on. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Romans 16 says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery they deceive the minds of naive people. So, if there is only one Christian church, why are there so many denominations? Because all people are sinners with a sinful nature that rebels against God and against the truth. On the one hand, Paul desires that all Christians gathering at a church ought to be completely united in what they believe the Bible teaches. On the other hand, Paul commands us to confront those not united in the truth and avoid participating with them if they persist in false teaching. And some other, other verses you could look up include John chapter 17, Mark chapter 3, Acts 15, the book of Galatians, and Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. So now, how does God want us to strive toward unity? Since we can't read hearts, what ought we to base our unity on? Paul stresses unity around whether or not what is taught and preached is the truth. And the Bible never teaches that one truth revealed by God in the Bible is less important than any other revealed by him. And so God desires complete unity in confession. Here confession means one's public statement of what teachings one believes and how to put them into practice. In other words, you don't pretend to be in unity when you're not. Sincere believers will always separate themselves from false teaching for three reasons. First, for love of God and His Word. And I'll read to you from Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. You can also look at Revelation chapter 22, and it says this, I warn everyone who, who hears the, pro the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So simply, uh, because we love God and His Word, then this is why we, we uh, separate from others who don't hold to the truth. Uh, secondly, uh, we can flip to 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says this, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus 
so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So, in other words, uh, he says to separate from these kind of people because it helps um, it helps them to recognize their own false teaching. It it shows love for those who are teaching something false. And thirdly, uh, we flip to Matthew chapter nine. It says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So we here we see uh, love for those who who are unlearned in God's word, uh, that they need to hear what God has to say so that they can uh, know the truth and keep it close. I'll also read to you from from the book of Jude, uh, seventeen to twenty-three. It says, But, dear friends, remember that what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So again, it shows a love for for others who don't know God's word, that they can be armed with the truth. Here's another passage. It says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. That's from Titus chapter 1. We also see this. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage, with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, 
that will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. From 2 Timothy chapter 4. So, does the Bible instruct us in any other ways to strive towards unity? We work toward unity also, uh, true unity, when we demand that our pastors and teachers have a thorough knowledge and faith in all the scriptures, and when we expect people joining our churches to join us in learning accurately the saving truths of the Bible. In fact, it's for this very reason that we have this study, um, both for those that are looking to uh, see what our church teaches and, and, and see if that's their confession too before they join our church and also for those who have already joined and now re-examining these, these truths that are so important um, as they continue to confess them. So how does God want us to strive toward unity? The Bible clearly teaches that Christians are to both seek unity with those who agree with the scriptures and to separate from wrong teachers and their teachings. This is the doctrine of Christian fellowship. Now, some churches seek unity with others without agreement on the teachings of the Bible because of two presuppositions which they hold. First, they teach that scripture is unclear on, on some things. Therefore, they say we should not be adamant about such things. However, Scripture is clear, and I'll read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy says, um, it says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Uh, the second reason that people uh, seek agreement with others without unity in, in teaching is they, they teach that true spiritual love means you must tolerate those who disagree with you. However, we cannot tolerate false teaching. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 16, verse 17 for that. It says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. We can also look at uh, Titus chapter 3. It says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So this is the, the doctrine of fellowship, that God desires complete spiritual unity. Uh, and, we, and we've seen this. Why unity? Well, out of a love for God and his word, out of love for the one who is teaching falsely, and out of 
a love for those who could be led astray. Unity in what? Unity in teaching. And let's look at uh, Romans 16, 17, and 18. It says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. And Second John 10 says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. And again, we turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, and we look at verse 17. It says, Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. So that's uh, talking about um, all the, the different worship activities we have, and this also certainly includes communion. We also turn to 3 John verse uh, chapter 1. 3 John chapter 1 verses 8 to 10 says this, We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. So, let's take it deeper. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5 says this, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So, explain this. We appreciate fellowship more as we grow in faith and maturity. Well, that can be true. Because as we grow in our faith and, and grow up more mature, we appreciate uh, these finer points of God's teaching and and how they how they are applied uh, as we seek to worship God in every aspect of our lives and give a clear confession of his truth in all that we do. Explain the difference between the holy Christian church and the many different types of Christian denominations. Well, the Holy Christian Church is the collection of all of God's people, all believers, all people who truly trust in Jesus for salvation. Now, uh, there are lots of different Christian denominations. Um, for example, uh, there are uh, Catholics, Presbyterians, Lutherans, there are Baptists, and many others. And and these different divisions, um, they are the kind of divisions we see with our eyes as we drive down the road and we see one church after another, um, and they are not united. Still, the Holy Christian Church is present anywhere that God's Word is preached. What is a denomination? A denomination is a religious organization whose congregations are united in their adherence to its beliefs 
and practices. Now, some churches, and even groups of churches, call themselves non-denominational. Do you see anything odd about that? What's odd is that non-denominational churches are still united as they hold the teachings that they do and do not believe, so the term non-denominational is a contradiction. Now what's the difference between a heterodox church and a cult? Well, the word heterodox means other teaching. It means something other than the whole truth. And a cult is a group of people that don't teach the truth. Uh, it is sometimes, uh, it sometimes has a sense of a smaller group of people. Uh, like you might have a, a very small cult of only a handful of people somewhere. And, but the idea is that they're teaching something that's not true. So uh, people in a cult would be heterodox and heterodoxy can be um, a small amount of falsehood or entirely false and it's that entire range. But if, some, if a church is heterodox at all, it means they are not teaching the whole truth. Agree or disagree? The invisible church includes all who have the true teaching. Well, with this, we could uh, disagree. Uh, just because somebody has true teaching doesn't mean that they're part of the invisible church. Uh, so, so, for example, a church may, may read all through scripture and they may teach it very well, but if, if somebody hears that message, they may still not believe in it, or they may still twist those words around. Uh, so just having good teaching, that alone doesn't mean somebody's going to be part of the church. Um, it still requires faith to receive these things. Agree or disagree? Everyone in the invisible church is going to heaven. With this, we could agree. If you're part of the invisible church, it means you have true faith in Christ. And as long as you have that, you have forgiveness of sins, life, salvation, and everything that comes with it, including heaven. Agree or disagree? As long as you believe in Jesus, it doesn't make any difference what church you join. We would disagree with this. And we disagree because of what we said earlier, that God, for several reasons, he wants us to hold to the truth and to confess that clearly. Um, so it does make a difference which church you join, because by joining a church, you're joining them in fellowship and you're approving of, of what they teach. So simply by joining yourself to a church, um, if it's a church that you don't agree with, well, then that's already a sin because um, you're not clearly confessing uh, the truth. Agree or disagree? It's wrong for a Lutheran to worship in a Methodist church. Again, here we would agree and the reason is the same uh, if if there is a lutheran who is convinced of the of the truth of scripture and then goes to any other church and tries to join with them in worship now they're going against what they believe now they're going against the truth that they are convinced of and they're not only sinning against the truth of god's word but also against their conscience that tells them differently that, that tells them that what's being preached and taught isn't totally accurate. It's not all the whole truth. Agree or disagree? 
Lutherans of different synods should not worship together. Again, here we would agree, and the reason is still the same. Agree or disagree? Joining together in prayer at public events like sports is a beautiful ex expression of a diverse group of people's shared faith in Jesus. Again, this is one that you probably will hear very often from others, but um, as we've already seen that uh, when we pray, it is also an act of worship. So we want to make sure that we're um, not expressing our faith in that kind of way, uh, mixing in with uh, a bunch of different uh, confessions of faith because it's a, an act of worship. We will be um, uh, giving an unclear confession of what we believe um, and, and also uh, giving approval to, to others who would misinterpret um, and, and think that we're okay with what they believe and teach as we join together. So again, in love, we would um, refrain from prayer in that kind of situation. Now, I, I know that fellowship issues are some of the more nitty gritty um, kind of kind of uh, teachings of the Bible and, and especially the application of these issues. Uh, you know, what does it mean for my life as a Christian? What does it actually look like? These are the, some of the hardest things that we might need to wrestle with. Um, but it is also a, a confession of your Savior. It's a way to worship your God as you live out the truth in your life. And it's one of the ways that people see that. Um, so you certainly want to make sure you think through uh, not just what you believe, but also how you're going to show what you believe in your life. Uh, my prayer is that, that God's word has been beneficial to you this morning as it's uh, taken, taken more root in your heart and that you've, you've appreciated some ways that you can continue to, to show love to God and to worship him in your lives. As we now close, I, I'd like to finish with a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for uh, the fellowship of the church. We thank you that you have called us as your people, called us as your own, washed us by your blood, and united us together in the, the, the true Christian church. Lord, as we live out our faith, give us boldness and, and give us wisdom to know uh, how to make a clear confession of you and, and of your truth in our lives so that we honor you and glorify you in all we do. This we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. God go with you and bless you throughout your week.